Thank you, Marin. What a powerful, powerful message. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 21. We're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 1. Pray you have a blessed Memorial Day. It is so great to see so many out today and showing thanks, too, for the freedoms that we have, the lives that we're given. The most important life given, of course, is Jesus Christ. In a moment, we're going to read in Acts chapter 21. Yeah, I was thinking this past week, the number for me may be higher. However, I know for certain, at least, there are two times that I came that close to losing my life. Both of them, I was around my children. The first was years ago when I was a young adult and our daughter Whitney was preteen. We were at the ocean, um, Atlantic Ocean. And I'm always careful when I go to the beach. I, I respect water. I respect fire. I understand the danger of those things. But this day, we, the two of us, sort of drifted out far. Uh, I have never knowingly experienced an undertow, but it had to have been that. It was something I'd never experienced before. And we were tossed and thrown. I was struggling uh, to keep going. And it made it even more difficult when your daughter is draped around your neck holding on. But by the grace of God, we would have both, I believe, lost our lives. But by his grace, we came upon an old fishing pier. So that tells you we weren't out all that far. And I can remember coming by that and grabbing it and, and contorting my body to hide behind um, the beam that was coming up to hold that battered uh, fishing pier. And in about two minutes, that water subsided, things changed, and we got back uh, to uh, the beach. And I was exhausted. And I know God put that pier there to, to save my life. The other time happened right in my backyard. Our oldest son, Wilson, was home for Thanksgiving, and I decided I wanted to take care of the leaf problem. So I put him on the mower, and I was raking leaves, and that wasn't too bright. Uh, because as he began to circle around me, uh, a rock thrust from that at breakneck speed and came by. Now, the word onomatopoeia is a $6 word, but onomatopoeia, if you ever watch Batman when it goes bam or wham, or you watch the Roadrunner and you hear the noise, well, I had the first personal experience of onomatopoeia, that, and I've never had one before. It was literally, it went phew. And what I realized was that rock he picked up, had come, it had to have come. I've never had a sound like that before. And when it went by me, I knew what had happened. And my, my legs became like spaghetti. I literally dropped on the ground. I'm not exaggerating. And I think Wilson looked at me and said, what in the world is going on with that? But I realized if that thing had hit me in the temple, I wouldn't have been here uh, today. You know... It's one thing to be surprised by a life-threatening encounter. It's another thing to have foreknowledge of it and still meet it head on. That's what Jesus did at Calvary. He knew when he, from the point that he was very young in ministry, he realized that uh, God, the Father, had the plan for him to die where in Jerusalem. And, and so today we're, go, we're looking at Paul's ministry and the very same thing is true here, that he was headed toward Jerusalem. You know, we look at all that's happening in the world today. You don't believe that Israel and Jerusalem is at the center of God's plan? You got to wake up. Because we see that even in the book of Acts throughout history and in the future, Israel, Jerusalem is, is central to God's plan. And it was central for God here, in, contextually, in Acts chapter 21, for the apostle to make his way back to Jerusalem. You know, that day, had I known that the undertow had been so vicious, I would have stayed on the beach. Had, had I known that afternoon in the fall that, uh, that that rock would have come out, I would have never had my son on the deck while I was on the moor, while I was uh, out in, in the backyard raking. But I want you to see today that Paul, knowing the threat that lay ahead for him, set his hand to the plow, set his head straight to go to Jerusalem. Look with me at Acts chapter 21. 
Luke is writing Acts and he's speaking in the first person plural. After we tore ourselves away from them, we set sail straight for Kos, the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. Well, what did he break from? The people in Ephesus who had met him at Miletus. And then he traveled on. Finding a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we boarded and set sail after we sighted Cyprus. Passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria and arrived at Tyre since the ship was to unload its cargo there. We sought out the disciples and stayed there seven days. Through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So it was probably as much as 400 miles traveled by sea. They came to Tyre and the disciples there warned Paul and said, don't go to Jerusalem. When our time, verse 5, had come to an end, we left to continue our journey while all of them with their wives and children accompanied us out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach to pray, we said farewell to one another and boarded the ship and they returned home. When we completed our voyage from Tyre, we reached Ptolemaeus where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, where we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. This man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. After we had been there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands, and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, both we and the local people pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul replied, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, Luke says, we said no more except the Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also went with us and brought us to Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. When we reached Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters welcomed us warmly. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we thank you, Lord, for the resolve of Paul. But as we close this study uh, this morning, we're reminded that you have called each of us to be consecrated unto you. Lord, how that works out, how that takes effect in our lives, only you know. But Father, we pray today you would speak to us in this hour, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, after a number of months now and uh, my post-surgery break where I was out of the pulpit for three weeks and we had three individuals fill in for me, we're finally coming to the close of this study in Paul's three missionary journeys. We started in Acts 13. It must have been back in late October, early November. And finally, we're coming to the point where Paul's ministry and his third journey has come to a close. And we finally reached that point with him. And hopefully in this study, you have uh, gleaned some things that we can apply to our lives. There are three things really that jumped out at me that I want to bring forth. And, and the first was this. We see Paul's undeterred calling, that Paul had an undeterred commitment to the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't matter if there was dissension among the mission team. It didn't matter if someone left the team. It didn't matter if he was facing persecution. Paul kept the advancement of the gospel as his central task. He did not divert off of that course. The second thing, for Paul, uh, serving God meant facing adversity. We're going to look at that in just a moment, but it's very important for us to understand that when we choose to serve God, many times that will require us going through adversity. And so we need to be careful that we don't have this idea that we trust Christ and everything's going to be perfect in our life because if we have that uh, false notion, then when the first obstacle, the first challenge comes in our lives, we begin to doubt either one of two things. We either doubt God, why is this happening? to me, God, you must not love me. Or we begin to doubt ourselves. God, I'm not worthy. Do I need to measure up? And so there's a danger when we live our lives not understanding that the Christian life does involve adversity. And we see that with Paul here. But then there's a third thing that is so important. Paul committed himself to 
to public gatherings. Being in the fellowship was important. And if it's important, we saw for Paul, it is important for us. And we're going to see today that as Paul was traveling, he didn't travel in isolation. As he arrived in places, one of the first things he would do is he began to unite with believers. We're seeing today that he stays in the homes of believers. And so uh, uh, we see the importance of corporate gathering. And so all three of these things do we see today. Paul's undeterred devotion, we'll see the adversity that, that lay before him, the, the importance of the fellowship, all three. But I really want to focus on that second aspect today more than the other two. It was this, Paul was preparing to face adverse situations, that going to Jerusalem would not be easy for him. You know, one of the highlights of Karen's and my trip to Italy was what was called a Tuscan dinner. Now, this is an unpaid announcement, but uh, if you ever decide you want to go somewhere, you need to go to Italy. And if you ever need to find a group that would be good to plan that for you, Concord Baptist Church would be a great group. <laughs> it was amazing. One of the highlights of our trip was a Tuscan dinner. Uh, words can't describe how beautiful it was. It was about a 70 degree evening, real low humidity. We were in an outdoor setting. We had an Italian crooner singing songs, romantic songs. I had Karen right there beside me. We looked out and in a garden were t multiple tables set. And it, it was every color you could imagine. It was fruit. There was, you had any type of fruit you could imagine, all types of meat, vegetables, everything. And it, you can't imagine how nice it was. I, I wish you could, I mean, even a picture can't describe. It was the perfect evening. And we enjoyed every bit of it, the delicacies and all. But I want you to know also there have been dinners I've had outside of this country that have not been so good. When I was in a third world country, Karen was still in the United States, and I had to eat with John Parker. <laughs> John actually is a good roommate, though. John and I are out there, and some of you who have been on these mission trips understand it must be 90, 90 degrees and 90% humidity. There's no nice table set up. Somebody comes across town from somewhere we probably wouldn't eat if we were in the U.S., and they bring it across, and it's the water that you have is tepid, if not hot, and you're sitting there, and, and you're just hoping and thinking, God, keep me healthy through this trip as I eat this meal. Maybe you've been there. So we see... Such a, such a diversity between the Tuscan dinner and eating in a third world country. But there's another difference. When I was eating in, in Tuscany, I was just, it was all about me. I was enjoying everything. But when I was in that third world country, I was actually on mission for the Lord. And I think that's a picture of what happens in the Christian life. Many times we live the Christian life and we just think, man, this is going to be a Tuscan dinner. God is going to bless me. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. But I appeal to you often in the Christian life, it's more like a third world dinner. When God calls us to serve him, that it many times there may be ob obstacles, there may be uh, differences, there may be difficulties, and we need to prepare ourselves for those. So there's this false thought in Christianity, and we need to be careful of it. Uh, there was a famous preacher, I ought to call him by name, but I won't. But I will tell you, he's a charlatan. And his wife once said, and she does a lot of speaking, she said, God doesn't care about your holiness. He cares about your happiness. God wants you to be happy. Just be happy. And this woman speaks, and she speaks on behalf of her husband, and her husband is one of the most famous preachers around, and he closes his eyes when he talks, and, and it's all false. And think of the people who give money to this ministry and think, we're just going to have everything go well, and everything's going to be good for us, and then as soon as they send that money, they get news that something devastating has happened to their family, to their health, or whatever. And the first thing they begin to wonder, what is going on? What is going on? I want you to see today that Paul had a very real 
um, view of the Christian life. In fact, he prepared himself for difficulty. He was not surprised by it. The people around him may have, but not Paul. So as we close our study on Paul's journeys today, I want to focus on three things. And, and the first thing this morning, again, this adversity that Paul was preparing to face. I want you to see with me, the Holy Spirit prompted warning. Here in Acts chapter 21, Paul is making a beeline to Jerusalem. And it was for him, Jerusalem or bust. Nothing was going to deter him. Now the question is why? And the great thing is our Sunday school lesson today leads right into where we are going this morning in Acts chapter 21. Uh, there in among the Corinthians, as well as we know the Macedonians, Paul had collected an offering that he was to take to Jerusalem for Jewish believers who were suffering through a famine and in great need. And so we see that Paul, who had in our study today in 2 Corinthians 9, speaking about giving, was imploring the Corinthians to do this. In chapter 8, the chapter before that which we studied in Sunday school, Paul had this challenge to the Corinthians. He said, really, the Macedonians have done great. You intended to do well yourselves. And to the Corinthians, he said, finish the task. He said that in 2 Corinthians 8, 11. What was that task? To give fully and willingly to this offering, this special offering that was go to the Jews. Now, follow Paul's reasoning as he is setting his hand, his eyes rather, toward Jerusalem. He had just appealed to the churches, go all the way, finish the task. How could he, after he had asked the church to give willingly, to give all the way, to have gotten to say tire, as we saw today, and heard from disciples there, there's going to be adversity, there's going to be difficulty, how could Paul have gone back to the Corinthians and, the, and, and those in Macedonia and said, you know, I couldn't finish the task. You see, Paul was committed to finishing this task. And this special offering was important. It would serve to provide encouragement to Jewish believers who were going through a difficult time. You see, those Jewish believers often were ostracized by more Orthodox Jews. They would not have been cared for. And so this money that was coming would reinforce and encourage the believers, these new believers who were Jews who believed the true gospel of Christ. But it also would serve as a witness. It would be a witness uh, to other Jews there who had yet to believe Christ. And you could see what they said, man, this Christianity might be something very real because these people who are Gentiles are actually caring for these other Jews. And so it was very important. So Paul kept his hand to the plow and he was making his way to Jerusalem, hundreds of miles by sea, traveling by ground. But in more places than one, he was warned. We saw last week in Acts chapter 20 and verse 23, Paul says, in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions await me in Jerusalem. And the warnings continue in this chapter. In verse 4, he arrives in Tyre and the disciples led by the Holy Spirit warned and told Paul not to go uh, to Jerusalem. And then there was this man Agabus that we read about in uh, verses 9 and 10 and, and, uh, and 10 and 11. As we read in these verses, Agabus gave a visual representation of what would happen. You know, sometimes just like that wonderful song we just heard and the visual aspect of it really spoke to us even more. Sometimes when we see something, it speaks to us. And so Agabus took what was sort of a, a sash or something that would be tied around like we would use a belt today that would tie up the uh, lower garment for work. And he took that and he didn't use it for that purpose but he began to bind himself hand and foot. And, and this visual uh, picture was right before Paul. And Agabus is saying, what is happening to me, Paul, is going to happen to you in Jerusalem. But Agabus did not say not to go there. He warned him it was going to be difficult. But the traveling company with Paul in verse 12 implored Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. So we clearly see the Holy Spirit makes it very clear to Paul many times 
that when he was going into Jerusalem, he was going into the midst of a lion's den. And the people around him who loved him, who loved his physical life, were saying, don't go there. But I want you to see a second truth today, the resolve of the Apostle Paul. Now, common logic would tell you and me, don't go to Jerusalem, abort the mission. Danger lay ahead. The Holy Spirit has already told you that this is going to happen. Believers who truly care about Paul were saying, don't go to Jerusalem. You would think Paul would stop the mission, but you would be wrong. And we see two things that are important for us to know today. First, Paul continued in the fellowship. This is this theme I said that we've looked at throughout these three journeys. He continued. He visited Ptolemaeus. And when he was in Ptolemaeus, he was around believers. And Manasseh is the one that he stayed with as he made his way to Jerusalem. And then he stayed with Philip. Philip is acknowledged earlier in the book of Acts as one of the seven, but not only was uh, he a deacon, but he was also an evangelist. This is sort of an aside, but wouldn't you love to be Philip? This is Philip, the evangelist, you know, not a scoundrel, not somebody that just is showing up, but a man who was esteemed. He had daughters who prophesied, and again, he opened his home. And so we see here how important it was for Paul to be around fellow Christians. Not only that he could exhort them to grow, but he needed the fellowship. We need the fellowship. We need brothers and sisters in Christ. The Christian life is not a life to be lived in isolation. And as Paul was preparing himself, much as an athlete would prepare himself or herself to run a marathon, part of that preparation was to avoid isolation, being in and among Christians. And so I want you to see, not only did he continue in the fellowship of believers, but again, he continued on the mission. Now things seem confusing here because he tells us in Acts 20 and verse 22, we looked at last week, he was compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. That means there was a prompting, a pushing, a, 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 a drawing to Jerusalem from the Holy Spirit. Yet here we see the Holy Spirit is speaking through Agabus and warning him about Jerusalem. We see even in Tyre that the Holy Spirit was warning him and that the people concluded he was to not go to Jerusalem. So you say, okay, which way is it? Is it like we saw last week that he was being compelled and driven? Or is it like this week where he's being warned and told not to go? I think there's a simple explanation. The Spirit spoke to the people in Tyre and Agabus the truth that Paul's life would be threatened. Now, Agabus does not tell Paul not to go. He just tells him when you go, he shows him you'll go through difficulty. Now, the people around who saw this visual, um, this visual evidence were, were trying to implore him not to go. So I think the conclusion is this. First, the Holy Spirit was warning these people as prophets to speak to Paul that it was going to be dangerous but some of these individuals took it a second step and felt that meant that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. Now, we're looking at narratives here. We can't tell everything that's going. We know the Holy Spirit's not inconsistent. And so as we look even at the believers in Tyre, we don't know how mature they were. They were right in that it was going to happen. But I believe that they were wrong in telling him not to go. But you think about it. If you had a loved one, somebody you cared about dearly, and you knew they were going into a lion's den, there would be that element of you that would say, hey, the Holy Spirit is telling me this is going to be difficult. Just don't do it. They were well intending. But Paul understood this division. And so in verse 13, he says, for I am ready to not only be bound, but I am ready to die in Jerusalem for the name of Jesus Christ. And he went and verse 17 tells us that he arrived in Jerusalem. As we close this series of messages, I sort of want to wrap it up the way that we began a number of months ago.
And there's important truth to understand about Paul's life because Paul lived a life devoted to the Lord. Yes, there were people instructing him, counseling. Some was godly counsel, some was well intending, but not full counsel. But Paul had his eyes on Christ. And the reason he did is this, and this is important. He lived a life consecrated unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's fellow apostle Peter wrote these words in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, consecrate yourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, being ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And then what about Paul's words to a younger Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 5 through 6? It sounds like the one who was living it out was preaching because he said, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. And then he says these words, fulfill your ministry. Not go 90%, not get close and not go all the way, fulfill your ministry. For I, Paul, he said, am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is closed. Listen, Paul, as a consecrated believer, realized that his life was not his own life to save. His life belonged to the Lord. He was consecrated. You know, God may or may not call you to give up your life for the sake of the gospel, to give up your physical life. But I promise you this, God is calling you today to be consecrated unto him, to be set apart, to be different, to be focused. And that was Paul. I wonder today, is yours a life that is consecrated unto God? Well, let's look finally the result of Paul's pursuit to Jerusalem. And to be honest, we don't have time to look at all that happened, but a lot did happen. A lot that was prophesied was fulfilled. He was tied up. He was handed over to the Gentiles. We'll see that he was sent to Caesar. We know that his life clearly was threatened, that actually they had to sort of hide him out and, and, and protect him from literally losing his life. But we do know a few things. The offering reached its destination. Paul had preached and said, do this, Corinthian church. Finish the task, and he finished the task. You know, when we as Christians, when we're consecrated, and we call people to do things that we're doing, there's a power in it. And so Paul had finished the task. He had completed. Secondly, there was major unrest. As soon as he got there, it was not long before all the rumors floated. All the, all the antagonists came out. Everybody was against Paul, it seemed, other than the few believers. And it, it was not easy. But we know that even as Peter said, that to consecrate yourself, to set apart Jesus as Lord and be ready to give an answer for the defense. We see that in Acts chapter 22 when he gives his uh, testimony. In Acts chapter 26 when he gives his testimony before a leader, we see that he himself was fulfilling what Peter was calling. And then there's an interesting thing. Paul eventually arrived in Rome. The people were saying, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul, compelled by the Spirit, went to Jerusalem. But you know, Paul had in his heart to go to Rome. If he had never gone to Jerusalem, he may never have gone to Rome. Because when he appealed to Caesar, he was sent to Rome. And so we don't know what God will do with a consecrated life. People will look at it and say, man, don't do that. Or man, if you do that, that's going to happen. And then you consecrate yourself to the Lord and to whatever task he's given. And God works in ways you can never imagine. Paul went west because he was obedient to the Lord. You know, after months of this study and a break in between, we've come to the end of it. And I do want to go back to where it all began in Acts 13. When we started this journey with Paul, before the first missionary journey, the Holy Spirit said to the church, set apart for me Barnabas and Paul for the work to which I've called them. Consecrate, set apart. Paul was consecrated for a task, and now after months of study, after years of his life, it came to completion. But I want you to see it all came full circle. Because the church, the Holy Spirit, came at Pentecost. 
We know there were many believers. It was really at Jerusalem when God began to work with the mission heart. And we see that it went from there to Antioch, and the church at Antioch was a sending church. And the church at Antioch began to send out, and he went westward, he went north, he traveled back south, he came back in the three journeys, and he came to Antioch after his first journey, came to Antioch the second time. But this time he comes back to Jerusalem. He comes back where it started. The one who was set apart unto the Lord had come full circle, had done what God had called him to do, and God brought him back. I wonder today, for what and to what is God calling you? We're not just to be here taking up oxygen. We have a calling. It may be a specific calling in this church. It may be a calling in your workplace that God has put you somewhere and you're wondering, you're thinking, how am I going to learn this job? And God is saying, you don't understand. I put you in this place to be a light, to be a light to the, to the nations. I, I share with uh, Vicki Lee, and we need to pray for Vicki. Vicki is in the hospital. We hope she'll be getting home uh, tomorrow. But often there uh, at the Woodland, I'll pray for Vicki and I'll say, Vicki, just be a light where you are. And she is being that light. What is God calling you to? Why has God placed you where you are? Are you living a life that's consecrated, faithful to finish it out? We need to finish the task. That's the wonderful thing we see of Paul. With everything going on, he finished what God had called him to. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your...